Hello Internet. In today's historical adventure, we will be discussing a part of the Danish colonial history that most people don't really know about, or for that matter, probably don't care much about. However, it is at the same time a fairly interesting part of that particular history, and it's also a rather tragic part. I'm talking about the 50 years from 1800 to 1850, where Denmark spent a lot of time, money, effort, and blood to try to stop the slave trade out of the uh, gold and slave coasts of Africa. So, yeah, enjoy. Allow me to set you a scene. It is 1805, late summer, smoldering hot sunny day in the Ashanti capital of Kumasi in what is modern-day Ghana. A Danish representative, small, with a whip wig and typical 18th century clothing, is standing in front of the tall and well-built African monarch and describing to him the phenomenal news that under King Frederick VI of Denmark, the European nation has decided to finally stop the slave trade. It is illegal. No longer will Africans be taken by force from their native lands and brought to the New World to be slaves and work themselves to death in plantations. The king looks coolly at the envoy and then replies through his interpreter. The king of Denmark can do what he wish in his country. In this, I will do what I wish, and I wish slavery. There it was. The first rejection of a European ban on the African slave trade had come not from the Europeans, but from a native ruler. The Ashanti had built their empire upon the slave trade and had no intention of changing their particular traditions because some northern European white guys have decided that morality had changed and was no longer what they had been for a hundred years. For those hundred years, Denmark had, like many other European countries, maintained tiny fortresses and small colonies on the gold and slave coast of Africa. It had begun in the late 1680s. It had reached a first crescendo around 1730-40 under a person named Søren Schilderup, who was so famous and so even beloved by the native Africans that several native rulers tried to have him marry their daughters. He basically became a native folk hero for quite a while, and all he did was, well, to maintain and build slavery to unknown heights. This was always the secret. Europeans were never strong enough in Africa during the slave age to actually plunder or abduct the slaves they needed for their West Indian and American plantations. It always happened in union and alliance with strong native rulers as there simply were not enough white people in Africa at the time to do any sort of military campaigns themselves if they wanted to actually have some success and not simply be annihilated. Even during the so-called golden age of the 1780s under the governor Jens Adolf Kjør, who created a small empire of several hundred miles surrounding the Rio Volta and built six new fortresses to maintain his position, that campaign of expansion was done by native armies that the Danish hired either as mercenaries or simply by promising them new slave deals so they could sell their enemies and make more money and get more guns. Interestingly, however, this golden age were also carried with it the seed for the abolition of slave trade because one of the persons on the coast at the time was a young 
German doctor in Danish service called Paul Isert. He became a strong abolitionist, probably the first real Danish abolitionist who actually had some experience with the native slave trade. And he united with local forces in Copenhagen at home and, of course, brought in propaganda and information from the great British abolitionists, such such as uh, Thomas Clarkson and William Wilberforce. And they together finally convinced Count Ernest Schimmelmann, the richest man in Denmark and the proto-prime minister of the time, that the time had come. Slave trade was no longer profitable, and the moral correct decision at the same time would be to abolish it. And in 1792, by the command of King Christian VII of Denmark, the nation published its ban on all slave trade within Denmark's reign, dominion, and territories. Finally, no Africans could be exported by Denmark from Danish territories or to Danish territories, the first country in the world to make such a decision. The ban was to take effect 10 years later in 1802 in order for the slave owners of West India to sort of gather enough workforce not to be completely destroyed by this new import ban and also to deal with the structural problems that might arise from shutting down one of the major parts of the Danish mercantile trade at the time. Well, 1802 came, the ban stepped in force, some slaves were still being exported from Africa, they they heard, and the Danish government sent their representative to spread the good words to the native rulers of Africa, who would, of course, be so happy that they would immediately help the Danes prevent this further moral outrage. Well... In 1805, we saw what happened in Kumasi. Fortunately, this was during the Napoleonic Wars, where Denmark was allied with the French, and shortly after the King of Ashanti had resisted the Danish ban, the English went over, as it is known, stole our fleet and bombarded Copenhagen. The ending of the Napoleonic Wars went bad for Denmark. French, our allies, lost. We lost Norway. That was an integral part of our kingdom at the time. And the state itself went bankrupt. There simply wasn't enough money. And for 20, 30 years, the coast of Guinea more or less had to handle themselves. The governors had to maintain the ban on slavery, but without forces, money, and support from home, this became ever more difficult. For the first 15 or years or so until the early 1820s, there's not that many records from Guinea left over, but it would seem that the governors and the traders at the coast more or less ignored the ban from home. Their money came from slave trade, and with the Danish government in complete disarray, there was no one left to, well, force them or stop them from breaking the ban. From the early 1820s, however, stronger governors, in character at least, started to arrive in Guinea, and Denmark started to try to make war in order to stop the slave trade that has so now illegally developed on the coast. This was a major disaster. For years, for nearly 20 years, Denmark tried to make war against native rulers and their Spanish-Portuguese slave trader allies, and it was disastrous. Defeat followed defeat. Danish people died, suffered, and was buried on the Gold Coast in a futile attempt to prevent the export of slavery from around the Volta that so few er years earlier had actually been our main supply route. Then came 1842. 
the year of change. The man pictured is Edward Carstensen, the last Danish governor of the coast of Guinea and one of the noblest and most tireless souls to ever work during the Danish 150 years there. He immediately decided that the main problem was that the natives would never support a ban on the slave trade until the Europeans could show them an alternate source of income. His decision was simple. He decided that instead of having the plantations of rubber and coffee and cotton in the New World, put them in Africa. Had the, have the Africans themselves work on it. Give them something to believe in beyond selling their countrymen. This worked. Once again, an alliance was forged with certain native chiefs. The Danish state had now more or less recovered from the bankruptcy and military resources were once again ready to be used in Africa. For the next three years, Carstensen had great success. He started plantations in the Danish area. Some of them were beginning to be successful. He fought wars to stop the native rulers and their European allies like the Spanish slave trader Mora or the great de Souza, the greatest of the surviving slave traders on the Rio Volta. He decided to go home and get further support. A Danish ship was permanently stationed at Guinea. A permanent military presence of actual Danish people rather than hired natives for the first time in nearly 80 years. Fortunately, despite the success of his military campaigns, those had taken some attention away from the plantation work and in order to gain more support, Carstensen once more decided on a flying trip to Copenhagen to gain more support for the plantations, more workers, more tools, more seeds, more anything. It was a really quick trip, a seven-month round trip from Guinea to Guinea around the West Indies and Copenhagen. Unfortunately, the men left in charge with Carstensen gone was not of his nature, and they bungled the job horribly, upsetting the local uh, alliances, and when Carstensen returned, the whole area was completely riveted with chaos, destruction, civil war, murder, and atrocities amongst the very people he needed in order to maintain the control that allowed him to prevent the export of Africans illegally. Carstensen did not give up, but he had to call on all the military resources he had available and every last scrap of his personal authority and character magnetism in order to bring the area back under peaceful control of the Danish authorities. This took nearly three years and by the time the area was ready again the plantation work was completely dead. It had been neglected completely for three years and there was simply no one left beyond himself who either cared or had the strength of will and health in order to prevent the whole thing from collapsing around him. So in 1848, Carstensen gave up, broken, disillusioned, the last European fighter in the Danish areas for the equality of white, black and the illegality of slave trade. He recommended that the area be sold to someone who could better enforce the new anti-slave morality and in 1850 the Danish king sold the entire Danish Gold Coast to the British who a few years later utterly routed the native slave trade rulers and achieved what the Danish had not been able to. Well, there we are. A hundred years of Danish slave history in Africa and it was mostly a success in so far as such a thing can be said to be a success. Then 50 years of trying to stop the slave trade in Africa and it was a miserable failure, taking an absolute moral 
paragon to even try to truly bring under control. And finally, with great effusions of blood and work, it became, well, useless. It was the same story through the entire time during the coast. If the Danes could ally with the natives, we could achieve our purposes. If we could not, things would fail. This was always the major issue. Denmark was never strong enough in Africa to actually achieve its purposes on its own. Well, this was, of course, just a major overview. I might return to this subject again one time to be more, shall we say, in-depth with some of the periods or the sum of the persons or some of the themes that has been mentioned here. But at least I hope you enjoyed this quick and dirty summary of the Danish fight against the slave trade towards the end of the colonial period. Next time, though, when we return to history, we will be in southern Germany. We will be in a meeting lasting four years with no coffee, and there were three popes at the same time arguing about it. Until then, I have been the sage. Have a nice day. <laughs>